You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 255, A Hill to Die Upon. Hosted by Dan Terry. We are down for whatever you're down for. And Joseph Wren. Fairies wear boots, man. You gotta believe me. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you fight the twin heads of vengeance with your atomic breath, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Hey, Joe, you ready for some more black metal? Because, you know, I've just decided to force more of that on you. Is this black metal? I thought this was metalcore. Not all the time. It's mostly black metal. It's black metal-ish. Let's put it that way. Just because the dude grinds on the snare and plays the gravity blasts as crazy as he possibly can does not mean that this is slow, dirging, hardcore sometimes. It's actually a very interesting blend of your favorite styles. Well, the, uh, yeah, it, it is a blend. I mean, they're, they're technically tagged as a blackened death metal band um, and with a little bit of melodic death metal in there. You're onto something with the metalcore as they started off as a hardcore sort of project, but eventually started listening to heavier and heavier music. As I've said, listening to heavy music is very similar to porn in that, you know, you start off relatively vanilla and before you know it, you're listening to things that you would have never imagined that you'd listen to. And then all your friends and family stop talking to you. Nobody wants to have anything to do with you. And so you go off and you live in a cave like a troll. I forgot whether I was talking about porn or black metal there. Are you, in fact, a troll in this scenario? I mean, if if listening to this kind of music makes you a troll, then yes, I am 100% a troll. And um, and I'm here for it. I first heard of A Hill to Die Upon when I was at Cornerstone, and I believe it was Cornerstone 2007. I could be wrong on that. But uh, they had the Cornerstone Day of Metal uh, that was presented by Bombworks Records. And uh, Bombworks put out a lot of bands that I liked, uh, a lot of Christian metal bands that I liked uh, back in the day, back when I was doing my old Christian metal magazine. So I was very involved, not involved, but I was very in... Uh, I was very informed on everything the labels like Bombworks were doing. Um, And I remember this band, A Hill to Die Upon, come on and play. And uh, they just, they absolutely blew me away. They were extreme metal. They were from the United States. And um, it was, it was interesting. It was actually interesting music and had influences that other Christian metal bands didn't have. Now, A Hill to Die Upon is one of those bands that came up in the sort of Christian metal scene, but don't personally identify as a like religious themed band the first thing you played for me is the second album omens and today going back to it it's still surprising to hear very simplified dissonant guitars and vocals that might be black and death metal but to me they just sound like that metalcore or that hardcore band then the gravity blast starts and it's a strange combination of styles and skills. It absolutely should not work, but the production choices and the fact that the band is clearly all in on the decisions, it works. When it's epic and melodic, it's that. When it's dingy and dirgy and doesn't feel clean, it's that. The band has a very dark concept throughout the discography, And I think it ties everything together in a way that is just enjoyable for the extreme music fan, but it's not above and beyond progressive, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing about A Hill to Die Upon, and this is a preview of what my final thought's going to be, I don't think that there's a point ever where the band blows my mind with their, you know, overwhelming level of skill. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, I don't I don't typically judge bands like this in that way. Uh, I'm more about the mood and the vibe that they're throwing down. And so, again, seeing them at Cornerstone in a sea of metalcore, hardcore sort of bands, uh, A Hill to Die Upon stood out. You know, they, they were, I don't remember if they were wearing corpse paint or not whenever I saw them. Uh, if they were, it would have been running really badly because it was like a million degrees uh, out there and uh, they they just they just went for it. But uh, I remember picking up their first album. Uh, I don't think I actually bought it at Cornerstone, but I did end up eventually getting it. And um, I really I, I really enjoyed it. And it reminded me 
of a lot of bands that were not really associated with like the Christian scene uh, bands out there. And I think that was the most refreshing thing about it is it was pure metal. Well, before Dan continues into the holy despair, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion Podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. We do enjoy our five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. And uh, you can review us now, I believe, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify starting soon. I don't know if by the time you hear this, if they have implemented that or not, but hopefully they have. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what to do about that once I have some more information. But uh, one thing to add to Joe's list of places where the podcast can be found, uh, we have uploaded the entire podcast to YouTube. I believe you can now listen and subscribe to the podcast directly on your YouTube app. Uh, if you want to make it easy on yourself, you can just listen straight from uh, straight from your from your phone. If you haven't ever found a podcast player that you like, personally, I, I recommend uh, Podcast Addict. That's my favorite way to listen to not my own podcast, but everyone else's. I- I'm just kidding. I totally listen to to my own podcast. I mean, why would I why would I make a podcast collecting all of my thoughts? I'm not going to remember those thoughts. I have to go back and listen to what those thoughts were at the time when they were fresh. But with that, another cool thing that we're going to be doing is band sponsorship. So if a band, uh, if you're in a band and you like this show and you want us to give you a shout out or um, to, to link to your stuff, tell people about your band, we are open to having bands or businesses uh, sponsor episodes of the show. You could reach out to us on Dan and Joe show at gmail.com to discuss what the options are. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. We are down for whatever you're down for. So Dan, Tell me about A Hill to Die Upon. A Hill to Die Upon is an American blackened death metal band. They're from Monmouth, Galesburg, or the Monmouth, Galesburg area. They're from Illinois, Joe. They're a band from Illinois. <laughs> so so they're, they're, not, they're not that far away from, from us. Uh, they've been around since 2004, formed by brothers Adam and R. Michael Cook. And when they started this band... They wanted to start a hardcore band, but eventually started listening to death and black metal. And uh, as you can tell, that's the style that they kind of went with. That's the one that they they, they took to. And um, they they've been pretty much with uh, with Bombworks for most of their career. Really hard with Bombworks because I can never remember entirely if Bombworks is still around or not. I have to look into that. But their first three albums were on Bombworks. And their latest one was on Luxor Records or Luxor Records. Um, but they they went really far for a band that came from the scene that they came from, if that makes sense. I'm not like dogging the Christian metal scene or anything, but like there was definitely a shortage of like non-metalcore uh, sort of bands in, in that scene in those years. They put out their first record in 2009, and that was prime time for kind of all the hardcore and metalcore bands. But I remember it actually being pretty exciting seeing this band play live and in that context and there was this boom uh in the cornerstone scene i remember when joe and my band uh end of destiny played at cornerstone we played before crimson moonlight which was insane (laughs) you know to have a band from overseas playing in the heat of an illinois summer and uh so i mean there was a demand for bands like to hill a hill to die upon but they were few and far between, and I think that these guys did it right. And uh, by by kind of being like, no, we're just a we're just a band, we're just a metal band. You know, uh, I know it's cliche and people get mad about it or whatever. But some people don't want to be labeled as unblack or <laughs> or whatever whatever that is. And if you read the lyrics of this band, you find that their lyrical content is not all that different than bands like Iron Maiden, where you draw from a lot of literary concepts and different mythologies and things like that. So I think it I think it all works out really, really well. The concept is very dark. And that creates an atmosphere that works for this band. I think it's interesting you're saying they wanted to start a hardcore band but then got into death metal. I don't think they truly abandoned the hardcore, at least not in the early part of the discography. But again, 
the way they put the combination together, it works. It creates something dark and very unique to have this onslaught of percussion, these extremely dark, brooding, growling vocals, and then melodic, dissonant, slowed down guitars. It creates that winter sound, but still has the direct production choices that you would hear on your favorite metalcore record. Well, I think we better get into it then. 2009, Infinite, Titanic, Immortal. All right, this record is exciting for me. This is their probably their most blackened death metal sort of sound. I don't hear as much of the hardcore uh, as Joe's talking about. Don't worry, it is going to pop up. Uh, but here, here they sound an awful lot like a band that I like that we probably need to cover on the show at some point uh, called Behemoth. And uh, they uh, remind Behemoth. Me, yeah, yeah. We, you know, there, there's a huge in, there's a huge influence from Behemoth especially in the vocals in the way that the songs are heavy and extreme but it's like more there's no way to describe it other than it sounds like you're in a snowstorm in the middle of the woods and some dude screaming a story at you uh from like 10 feet away and normally that would sound really bad but trust me it sounds really cool here um the vocals also i have to give compliments for doing this type of style he's very easy to understand and enunciates really really well and speaks slowly because i'm i'm dumb i need people to speak slowly to me sometimes <laughs> but i i really i really connected with the lyrics on this on this record record even though it's like a lot of like mythology and things like that but i could understand it as i was listening without having to read the lyrics uh which is a welcome change from a lot of the metal that i listen to and um but yeah they, they have these like almost melodic dissonant passages that creates a really dark atmosphere and the vocals actually are kind of hooky in places which is uh which is different than what i'm used to with extreme metal like it's it's very well produced and sounds way better than a band than most bands that i say oh yeah i saw them in cornerstone at 07 when an album has a dark atmosphere that is pleasant to the ears and doesn't get old that to me is a hidden gem one of my favorite styles of intro and outro i point to carcass i point to zeo i point at scott mellinger and russ and i say guys how do you move that minor chord and that diminished chord up and down and make it sound interesting every single time you do it the answer is you do it like a hill to die upon is doing it on this first album the hardcore is there but it's the melodic intro and outro sound that you hear on your favorite metalcore records where we're playing cleanly to make it sound dissonant, to make it sound uncomfortable. Now mix that with the death metal, the blackened death metal that we're getting on this album. It doesn't sound so cold, but it definitely doesn't feel comfortable. It sounds like the gray is tinting towards the blue on this one. And it's just an interesting listen because when you think it's going to get old, and you think that the riff hasn't changed, it just doesn't get old. And I can't explain why. It's a good listen, it's not a fun listen, but I'm enjoying it. And if this is what they stuck with throughout the discography, I'd be on board with it, but they're not just gonna stick with this. No, it's interesting. And I think that this record as a package on its own is fantastic. And they will return to this sound. Uh, but it's interesting kind of going on in their career because this is where we're going to start seeing kind of more of that hardcore beginning kind of come into play. 2011, Omens. So Omens aesthetically is very similar to, uh, you know, Infinite, Titanic, Immortal in the sense that like they're, they're playing the same style. But what I start getting, what we start hearing here are slightly faster tempos in the songs. The drumming becomes more, more sort of flurried and furious. And there's parts where everything starts getting a little bit more crazy, a little bit more chaotic. And I think that's kind of where the uh, the sort of sort of some of the hardcore influences are, are sneaking in, with a little bit of the dissonant choices being made. The vocals are deeper and a little bit more hardcore on this. They're a little bit less black metal. And I'm being nitpicky here because I think overall this is a really good record um, and shows off a, an interesting diversity. But at the same time, I don't think that it necessarily is the united vision that the first album was. If another band put this combination of ideas together, it would sound sloppy. It would sound disconjointed. It would not work. 
I cannot tell you why it works when a hill to die upon does it. We kept pieces of the death metal, the over-the-top gravity-blasting drums, the aggressive growling vocals, but now the guitars are doing the hardcore metalcore thing. And it works, but that dissonance is still there. The minor feeling is still there. If the last record was gray tinting towards blue, this one's a little bit brighter shade of gray. It just works. It's an interesting listen. And I can't say another sentence about it because that's how much I'm thrown off by it. It's an entertaining listen because everything I'm hearing should elevate your blood pressure up a few pegs and this doesn't it's almost laid back and chill the way you would get from a real black metal record yeah it's uh it's like easy extreme music easy listening uh to to a degree because again for a band that's probably on a pretty small budget i would imagine it's putting out records that sound really good (laughs) you know um, even on streaming services in their in their lower quality, they still sound amazing. And um, yeah, I, I kind of I kind of get this weird mix of like hardcore black metal, death metal, a little bit of mellow death, and you know even just just hints of just like this slower like doomier stuff. It's not doomed to the point where it's sludge, but yeah, it's it's an interesting set of dynamics, and it's hard for me to put my finger on it, but I like it. I like hearing it. I like kind of the nuance of it. And they're they're able to 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 kind of throw you for a loop a lot without going into like weird prog metal sort of territory. Is there another band in 2011 that has this much intensity, but is this much laid back? I mean, not that I can think of. <laughs> not for that year. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody out there. For every underground band that we come up with, everybody you know it shoots back with 17 others, but. Um, this is what we had to listen to this week, and and um, I followed this band pretty much throughout their career. I was that impressed with them, seeing them live, and um, and yeah, I mean, I think for a for a sophomore album, I don't think it's as good as the first, but it's only like maybe like three percent worse than the than the first album, you know. Um, there's little things I can nitpick for sure, but I think I think the overall vibe is really strong, and um, and they, they, you know, if you like the first record, you're gonna like this one as well. Unless you're just somebody that just hates hardcore breakdowns, because there's a couple of those. Um, but o- overall, I mean, I, I think this is a really fine example of blackened death metal with a little bit of like, you know, melodic death metal or metalcore stuff thrown in there. 2014, holy despair. So this is interesting because if you're listening to these linearly or like what like from the uh, if you're listening in order, basically, a holy despair sounds like it should have come out uh, right after Infinite Titanic Immortal as it gets that it has that vibe for me. It's it's more it leans a little bit more on that, like black metal, like behemoth immortal sort of sound. Uh, the drums somehow are, are, are even are even faster and more extreme uh, than they were before. But I feel like kind of the more like storytelling aspect of the lyrics and stuff, it's all a little bit more, um, it's all a little bit more leaned upon here than it was necessarily on the um, on the previous record. Though I don't feel like there's as much hardcore here, but at the same time, there's this musical diversity going on where they are slowing it down and they are kind of incorporating other influences that are not noticeable at first. But um, I don't know. I feel like the songwriting overall is much stronger on this record than even on the previous two. And I and I thought those were good. There's always a hint of technical prowess when you're listening to these records. And this is not the first time they've let solos out. But I think these are the best leads in the entire discography. The vocals are doing exactly the same thing. But like you said, it's understandable. And I think that's important because that is the opposite of what I'm expecting, even with hardcore and metalcore. The band really does rely on that dissonant sound and setting a vibe almost like Hum would do with a groove. This band picks a chord and that is their vibe. I should be annoyed with it, but I'm not. I think this is a dark atmospheric experience, just like the previous records. It just has a little more of the death and a little less of the hardcore. I don't think it fails. It's just interesting to see that they're taking turns on this one. Yeah, I just like that they'll sort of lock into this. I don't want to use the word groove because I don't mean it like in a groove metal sort of way, but 
They, they will just kind of lock into this groove that sounds so good. You know, like so you'll every now and again, you'll hear metal bands. They'll play a specific riff or a, or a melodic sort of like dissonant passage that you just want to hear forever. And they, they hook me on the regular with stuff like that. Like if you look at like the, uh, the beginning of unyielding anguish, like I could listen to that for days, you know, like that's so good. Uh, the way it's put together. And uh, I think for guys that basically were like, yeah, we just want to play some black metal for you guys tonight. Uh, it's so much more than that. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 <laughs> th there's so much more nuance in it, but it's not like necessarily big brain music. It's just, if you're a, if you're an appreciator of extreme vocals and, and, and dissonant guitar playing, and you don't have a bunch of expectations for how black and death metal is supposed to sound or, 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 or whatever other genre you're going to come up with uh, to describe it. Um, these guys are, they're they are just able to, to make their growls interesting. They're able to hook you with the lyrical concept of the, of the songs. It's almost like they've taken a much more traditional, almost classical approach to their songwriting where it's like, what's our, what's our theme? What's our concept? We've, we've talked about so many metal bands on this show that just like, okay, we're going to play this riff here. And now the new riff starts here. And then we're gonna we're gonna bridge it together with a solo or a bridge or whatever, and then we're gonna end the song after X amount of minutes. Whereas all of these songs feel like they were polished to whatever perfection the expectation was for the songwriter. It sounds like this band is jamming. Yeah, but not jamming in the pointless way that you know jam bands do. All right, guys, here's 27 minutes. Who knows we're gonna where we're gonna end up? Billy came back from Vietnam, just a shadow of a man. Yeah, let's not talk about that. But. Um, <laughs> Oysterhead, if you're wondering. It's um, amazing. Go listen to it. Don't listen to Dan. I didn't say that they were bad. I just said we were talking about it. Now we're talking about it. God. But yeah, like, uh, again, if you're a fan of bands like Behemoth or Immortal or Old Man's Child or like any of these like bigger black metal bands, weird saying that bigger black metal bands. Um, but if you're a fan of that sort of stuff, you're going to you're going to love this. You're, you're going to love this band. You're going to love what they put out. And um, I'm st I'm definitely on board on this record. I know this sounds like a big advertisement. And we were talking about like bands sponsoring the podcast that that this. That is not the case here. This is just <laughs> legitimately a band that we picked that, uh, you know, I've been listening to for a long time. I consider them to be a hidden gem band that I like. And I um, was really glad that I was able to talk about them on the show in this capacity. 2017 via Artis via Mortis. <laughs> Oh, man. Let's take the atmosphere up a notch. Let's take the melody up a notch. Let's take this thing that we do, this strange combination of styles, and make it more epic sounding. This is almost more black metal than all of the other stuff because it's so full of its own atmosphere. And it's not a bad thing. I know when I say that, I'm usually like, oh, this is a bad thing. But like, you know, after hearing Omens, cause like I thought Omens was like, you know, the best thing or not Omens, sorry, uh, Holy Despair. I thought Holy Despair was like the best thing that they were ever gonna do. And I felt that way for a while. Um, but yeah, this record, this record I love and uh, continue to listen to to this day because it's so, so much more chill. I, I like, I don't think this, is, I don't think this is like, kicking the intensity up a notch as much here. It's not as like extreme metal in the traditional sense. It's a little bit more slowed down. It's a little bit more experimenty, but they've they they've fallen on the things that they do best. And it's that it's that melodic sort of dissonant counter melody that they do so so well. Um they they focus on that and they focus on the strength of the vocals and um the songs move along at their own albeit slower pace, but you're not going to care if you listen to the three albums that came before this. You're going to say this is the most in the pocket they've ever been. The album cover finally explained what I really think about this band. A hill to die upon sounds like a tragedy. I don't mean a Shakespearean tragedy. I mean an old community theater tragedy where the audience is expected to yell at the performers and get a response. Think that scene in Interview with the Vampire for those that love that movie as much as I do. The band makes you feel uncomfortable, but again, it's not taking that to the extreme. It's playing a strange combination of extreme music styles that should not fit together yet here we are four albums in almost 10 years later and the band is still doing the damn thing they're still locking into that minor dissonance 
And that is the sound of the next 45 minutes. 37 minutes if you're checking. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. But I appreciate that, too, because I feel like if the record was like really long, that it would sort of diminish the impact of it. I think the immediacy is in the runtime more so than it is in, you know, having to play as many riffs as you possibly can before the end of the record. And um, yeah, I mean, it's locked in. I'm sorry that we can't go any deeper into this, but like um, it's just very well put together metal from a band that you may not have heard of before, you know, which are some of my favorite types of episodes to do. I know they're shorter. You know, they're not four hours of me and Joe arguing with each other or arguing with Jeff or, hey, or or whatever, but this is a band that their next record is the better is the best record. And I feel like if they continue longer into the future, it's gonna be that way for a long time. Final thoughts on a hill to die upon. Dan. Yeah, I mean their next record is the best record, right? Like, um we, we, we don't give out the sure thing award, but I mean we've got four albums by this band that we've enjoyed to varying degrees and it really couldn't come up with a lot of nitpicky bad things to say about them. For an underground band, they don't sound underground. They sound like they should be on a big one of the you know, they sound like they should be on Century Media or Nuclear Blast or like one of those big labels uh, that, that specializes in this kind of music. So um, if anybody from those labels is listening, you know, check these guys out They're You know, they may not like have the biggest following in the world, but with a little bit of backing, I think they could be one of the bigger names in this style of music. There are pieces of this band that I have heard time and time again, taken too far, taken to the extreme. The drums are sloppy or they're too robotic sounding. The vocalist cannot be understood. The guitars are sloppy. The bass is not present. There are many things I could say about a band that takes one of these pieces and doesn't pull it off. A Hill to Die Upon takes multiple extreme styles and puts them together in a way that is easy to listen to. I challenge anyone to give me another example of that that as enjoyable as this band is. If you love hardcore, if you love blackened death metal, and if you want to hear what it sounds like when you put those two things together for four records, this is the band for you. Check out A Hill to Die Upon. You won't be disappointed. Dan, what's your album of the week? My album of the week, man, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't, I, I hate copping out and just using the band that we talked about. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to have to go with, uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, Holy Despair by A Hill to Die Upon. That's the album that I listened to the most times this week. So it's the only honest answer. For me, it's Paranoid by Black Sabbath. Fairies wear boots, man. You got to believe me. I mean, it's the, it's the absolutely the safest album of the week you could ever possibly have. Nobody's going to have anything bad to say about it. <laughs> I mean, if they do, they're dumb. So, I mean, there's that. Planet Caravan's on there. Planet Caravan's amazing. So that's that's all I have to say. I, I love Planet Caravan. It just makes me want to go to sleep, but in a good way. Take us out, DFT. If you guys like this podcast, and we know that you do, or maybe you don't, that's okay too. But thank you for listening anyway. But if you want to reach out to us, tell us we're doing a good job. Tell us we're doing a bad job. Uh, any Or give us recommendations on bands to talk to or about on the podcast. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Discuss Metal. And uh, you can also join our Discord server where you can talk to us directly. We are pretty much there all the time. Joe is somewhat of the eye of Sauron in the Discord server. He knows you're there. He knows what you're thinking. He knows you're about to type. So type. Come out and say hi to us. Uh, if you want to support the podcast financially, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal, where we have extra bonus episodes for you to listen to, uh, as well as monthly hangouts where we just sit down and find out how you've been doing for the past month, uh, because we want to give you a voice too. So, so come hang out with us on Patreon. And um, if you would like us to, sp or if you would like to sponsor an episode of discography discussion, uh, if you're a member of a band or you own a company and uh, you want to get some of that sweet, sweet advertising going, let us know. Send us an email at Dan and Joe show at gmail.com and we will talk about what options we have. And on that note, this has been episode 255 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. 
Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. I want to Scrooge McDuck into your money. $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 